We live in a world where computational imaging warps traditional boundaries in the photo video industry, where riding Moore's law means camera model obsolescence can and often is measured in months instead of decades. Firmware updates instead of hardware changes rule, where greater access to computer-aided design and manufacturing narrows the gap between the most extraordinary lenses and the merely very good ones, where social media, selfie sticks, and a camera in every pocket, courtesy of smartphones, mean more people than ever shoot more images in a year than some of the greatest photographers of all time did in a lifetime, where I can shoot an image like this. Even a video like this on a freaking iPhone, which, by the way, is what most of us, skilled or not, I now freely assert to you, probably should be using for casual shooting. It is also an era of global warming, growing income inequality, increasingly scarce natural resources, rising fascism, the cavalier disregard for historicity, overwhelming complexity, and the loss of civility, shame, irony, nuance, goodwill, cheer, reading thinking, perspective, all of which has what exactly to do with this morning's official announcement of the new $6,000 full-frame mirrorless interchangeable lens hybrid Leica SL2. And what the heck does any of that have to do with Vader? Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and today I want to talk about what I'll call Leica's hat trick. I think the second generation full-frame mirrorless interchangeable lens SL2 is now, conclusively, the third iconic, timeless camera in Leica's storied history. Of course, reasonable people can disagree, and I apologize to those of us who consider the T, Q, or the much earlier Leica Flex and Leica R series cameras also worthy of the appellation. Certainly, we can talk about it in the comments section below with respect. I also think it fair to say that Leica is now rounding out a lens line, the SL lens line, that consistently exceeds anything they have ever produced consistently exceeds just about anything I've ever seen from anyone for full frame, matching or possibly exceeding anything I've ever seen in medium format to be confirmed. I'm going to try to keep this brief because I've only had pre-production samples of the SL2 in and out of my hands for a couple of days 
three times over the past month with a variety of glass, and there is much for me still to learn and share with you. You know how slow I am. But what is already stunningly clear is that the SL2, subject to additional testing once production firmware is released, is most likely our next camera here at Three Blind Men and an Elephant, even in an era, as I just said, when differences in image quality and functionality across the industry have so narrowed across brands, price points, and formats that for most people, an SL2 is simply irrelevant, but not for me. Maybe not for people like you. Now, full stop. I am anything but objective when it comes to Leica. Those of you who know me already know this. I am absolutely biased. Born of my personal history with the brand dating back to 1963, when I first set eyes upon and then held in my hand my mother's 3A. Where is that guy? It's also born of my fascination with the history of the company. There is a lot to be said about that, not today though. The history of photography and the history of humanity. And a preoccupation with results. But full disclosure, it's also important to note that this year, for the very first time, we've actually worked with Leica on a couple of sponsored projects, which were a blast. It's living the dream. It's also the case that Leica covered travel, accommodation, and eats for a small group of journalists and social media folks like us to visit Leica HQ in Germany for a sneak peek and some shooting time with the SL2 and associated glass. I'm telling you, none of that stuff matters. For me, a Leica camera has never been just a tool. For me, it's a talisman. You may have heard me say this more than once too. Every time I pick one up, I feel a century's worth of history flooding through my brain, urging me to do good work, urging me to make it count. I think photography has always had a unique role to play in the real world. I think this has never been more true. Things have never been more serious than now, right now. And at the end of the day, the Leica SL2 is a serious camera, a serious camera system. Still, I hadn't anticipated that the SL2 would hit me so hard, nor that I would actually entertain entering such an expensive ecosystem. That's because, A, I'd done a four-part series on the original SL a year ago, and although I fell in love with it, I decided not to buy it. Man, the SL does it for me. What can I say? I love the Leica story, and my very small personal history with it. All of which, in the end, makes the SL a bit of a heartbreaker. I want one, but I can't justify the expense for me. I want one, but I want small, fast native primes. I want one, but I want better autofocus and low light performance. I want one, but I want a smaller, lighter body. I want one, but is there any way we can get rid of that what hump Igor communications hump on the top plate. You know, I don't mean to embarrass you, but I'm a rather brilliant surgeon. Perhaps I could help you with that hump. What hump? Maybe I should take a look at the CL. Though it has to be said, I fell in love with it the first time I ever picked it up, all the way back in 2015, at PPE. The first time I heard about it, what was most interesting about it was its breathtaking price. Okay. Let's hold that aside. Let's take, take a deep breath and then we can talk about it. From the top, tell me, why did you create this camera? Who is your target audience and what's special about it? First of all, take it in your hand, then you can feel it. I think a bit better when I talk about the product. I understand it. And the simplicity of the controls, I get. Is that what you were trying to do? Exactly, because now you understand the product. You're a bad right? boy, man. You're a bad boy. Even in dark times, there's room for a little levity and silliness. B. Not only have we been more than satisfied with what we own, a Panasonic GH5 and Sony A6400 for our commercial and documentary work, a Leica CL for my personal street work, and a pile of excellent glass from Leica, Zeiss, Sony, Panasonic, Sigma, and Olympus, but 
with the cameras and glass that we don't own but get to use coming in and out of rotation for extended periods of time here in the Batcave, like Panasonic's undersung G9, or Nikon's also undersung Z7, with some amazing glass as well. See, there are cameras out there offering rough functional parity, in some instances superiority, like Sony's autofocus, at a fraction of the price and or size. D. Claudia and I have other higher priority items on our list that go well beyond gear, like travel, home improvement, or eating. And E. In spite of all that, I was closing in on a Leica M10D with Type 20 Visoflex anyway. But the last 12 months have convinced us, not only from going hands-on with almost every new significant full-frame or crop sensor or medium format camera launched, but from evaluating where we are today and where we want to be with three blind men and an elephant. That there is significant value to us for resolution well above 24 megapixels, glass to match, robust weather ceiling, extraordinary color and noise performance at higher ISOs, and high performance IBIS, all easily accessible. We are already printing images up to three and a half by four and a half feet and viewing them at close distance, some of it in color. It turns out that sometimes Color does figure into our storytelling. It turns out we like the muted colors that come from shooting before the sun rises and after the sun sets. We like shooting in the rain, though, like it or not, it's clear we will be shooting more often in extreme weather. We already happily crop the crap out of an image if it serves the image and obviates the need for carrying additional glass, but this has become especially important in our street photography, where we want to keep it light simple and discreet. We've rediscovered the creative possibilities of motion blur within just a part of a frame on the one hand, and on the other hand, slowing down shutter speed beyond what the inverse rule suggests in order to get as close to base ISO as possible without incurring the bulk and weight of a tripod. Spending this much time with our gear has also reinforced for us the central role of a joyous shooting experience steeped in ergonomics, industrial design, menu systems, touch interface, apps, heritage, and did I mention results? I think I did. Did I also mention that I lent Claudia my CL for our Streets of New York workshop, and now I'm not sure I'll get it back, so I need another camera. I kid, I kid, we share. I think. Put differently, given what we had a year ago and what we were doing, we didn't need a 24 megapixel full frame camera per se, and still don't. The advantages in image quality and shallow depth of field were not significant enough for what we do to add one to our kit. High ISO performance was not really an issue a year ago. What we had worked at the ISOs for the subject matter and narratives we shot. Autofocus performance was never an issue for our photography, and when we needed better video autofocus performance than what the GH5 could muster, we had the A6400. We didn't need a bajillion autofocus calculations per second. Not that this is unimpressive or not a critical advantage for sports shooters, it is, but because we didn't and still don't shoot sports, or birds, or any other wildlife, or spinning models at eyelash shallow depth of field. We didn't need endless customizability with a zillion buttons because the way we shoot, and I believe at its core, photography is much more about being, seeing, doing, showing up, than it is about setting menu options. Maybe we should offer a t-shirt that says, no futzing zone. Of course, that's just us. But it turns out that we do want now that we've experienced and used it, what we'd begun to actively consider before the SL2 arrived on the scene is what just four of today's full-frame, high-resolution, mirrorless, interchangeable lens ecosystems can deliver that our current kit cannot. But only one of them does it like the SL2, and that's the SL2. So let's get into it 
beginning with how the SL2 differs from the original. Though I suspect by now, you already know most of this. First, the SL2 comes to market priced at 6,000 bucks, 20% less than the original SL did, without giving up anything in terms of solidity, heft, and feel, and packing a whole lot more, hold that thought. Leica is doing this at a moment when pretty much everyone else is trying, with varying degrees of success, to do the exact opposite, rapidly raising prices. Let's talk about this for a moment, because while the SL2 is still far and away the most expensive hybrid mirrorless full-frame interchangeable lens camera on the market today, 60% more than its L-mount alliance cousin, the Lumix S1R, 70% more expensive than the Sony a7R IV, and 120% more than the Nikon Z. We've been eyeing all three for a while now, with the Z7, I think, being priced far below its actual value to us and many others. The SL2 is also only 20% more than the Q2, or medium format Fujifilm GFX 50S, 4% more than the Hasselblad X1D2, 25% less than Leica's own M10P or M10D, 40% less than the GFX100, and a whopping 70% less than the Leica S-Type 007 medium format DSLR. As far as Leicas go, the SL2 is a bargain exceeded only by the CL and TL2 in my book, though the glass is another story. Let's move on. Next. The SL2 comes with a new processor and brand new 47.3 megapixel sensor. Not only does it offer twice the resolution of the original SL, entire M10 series, original Q, APS, C, TL2, and CL, but it offers better dynamic range, better high ISO noise, and color performance to boot oh baby. For what we usually do, this doesn't matter. For what we want to do next, it does. Third, the SL2 sports IBIS, which is a big deal, and I confess I'm surprised. It's reasonable to assume, given the L-mount alliance and the similarity in pixel count to the S1R and the company's respective core competencies, that this is the same unit found in the S1R. But still, I don't know how they found enough space inside what is essentially the same shell as the SL to get it in there. The SL2 does actually use a new shell made from magnesium and aluminum. In any case, the IBIS is really, really, really good and allows us to leave the tripod and gimbal at home. I haven't run rigorous tests, but based on these early days with pre-production units and the S1R we also have in-house at the moment, there's no reason to conclude that it is anything other than one and the same, and that makes it best in class. Fourth, the autofocusing, both for video and low light, is very much improved. The best I've seen on a Leica, as good or better than what I've seen on any Panasonic in my preliminary tests, which doesn't really make sense to me. But my early testing indicates that Leica glass focuses better on the SL2 than the S1R, and Sigma glass maybe as well. To be fair, I need to do more runs with more glass to be sure. There's no phase detection autofocus, but you know what? It's all we need. Stay tuned. Fifth, Leica upped the EVF resolution from 4.4 million to 5.7 million dots, though the original was so good that I didn't immediately recognize a difference. I might if I compared them side by side, but I might not. This is likely the same unit found in the S1R and the A7R4. Sixth, Leica improved the grip by sculpting its inner surface and then layering in a nice rubber insert. It offers a much more reassuring purchase on the camera while holding it loosely at your side, and I really like it. Seventh, Leica addressed the port issues of the original. While they've wisely retained the full-sized HDMI port, now 2.0, the connectivity and charging port is now USB-C, and they've eliminated the need for an added cost mic and headphone adapter by including built-in industry standard 3.5 millimeter jacks instead. Yay. Eighth, Leica dropped the four unlabeled buttons on the back of the original SL inherited from their medium format S, which I didn't mind at all. I thought it was very clever. Conforming instead the SL2 to the same three-button layout of the M10 series and the CL. Simple, elegant, clear. Ninth, the weather sealing is improved. This is important now to us as well. You see it in the port cover, and you don't see it, but it's there in the magnetically linked only top right dial. What are we up to? 10? 10th? They improved the software interface, which is now absolutely best in class, arguably exceeded only by Hasselblad for stills and Black Magic for video. Maybe. 11th. In an homage to the R series, Leica engaged in a modest resculpt of the top plate EVF bump, which I think is quite successful. 
the front fascia, unlike the original, is now covered with the same material as the rest of the body. I'd never noticed that it was bare in the first one, but it's a nice upgrade nonetheless. Twelve. Interesting that I waited this long to cover it, right? The SL2 can now record DCI 4K up to 10 bit 422 all intra 30p internally, up to 60p at 8 bit 420 internally, DCI 4K 10 bit 422 60p externally, and 5K up to 30 frames per second long GOP 10 bit 420 internally or externally. There is a 1.09 times crop, however, and it does use pixel binning. 13th, while we're on video, Invoking Cine mode substitutes shutter angle for shutter speed, that's all that I noticed, which nonetheless is quite useful in the real world, obviating the need for futzing with shutter speed every time you change frame rate. Leica has also introduced floating ISO, so that as you zoom with a Vario, ISO will automatically compensate as the aperture changes with focal range. Fourteenth, we're almost at the end. They've managed to eliminate the young Frankenstein Igor what hump communications hump on the left side of the top plate. What have I missed? The SL2 has interval shooting. It has a maximum shutter duration of 30 minutes. Both card slots are UHS-2. Ah. Finally, the one other huge change since the original SL is more glass. When the SL launched four years ago, there was just one lens available for it, even though two were announced. You could only buy the Vario Elmer at 24-90 2.8-4. This is a spectacular zoom, and it was the right play for Leica back then, I'm sure. Today, you can buy the 90-280 Vario Elmer and 16-35 3.5 3.5-4.5 Super Vario Elmar. You can buy the 35-50-75 and 90mm Summicrons. You can buy the 50mm Sumalox. Over the next 12 months, like we'll be adding 21, 24, and 28mm Summicrons. Summicrons, by the way, by definition, in case you didn't know, are F2. Sumalux is 1.4. Noctilux is anything faster, currently between 1.2 and F0.95. Vario Elmer, it's variable between 2.8 and 4, and Vario Elmar is anything slower. For now, I'll just say this. With prices ranging from 4500 to 6400 a pop, every one of the SL lenses is very expensive and big and heavy, but every one of them I've used, the 35, 50, and 90 Summicrons, the 24 to 90, 90 to 280 Vario Elmerits, and the 16 to 35 Super Vario Elmar have just knocked my socks off, left me breathless. I am stupefied. Every single one. Spectacular resolution, brilliant micro contrast, and wonderful color corner to corner. Bulletproof build quality. Not only have they reset my expectations, but it's clear to me that the gating factor in the SL2's performance is this sensor, the brand new sensor. These lenses outpace it. They outpace every other lens line I've ever used. They beat out the best M glass there is. But the other piece of this lens pie is the fact that four years ago there was no L-mount alliance either. Today, you can buy three purpose-built, more modestly priced, native L-mount lenses from Sigma. The 14 to 28 2.8, the 35 1.2, and 45 2.8. I've got two of those here right now. Plus, adapted L-mount variants of their DSLR glass. The 21.4, 51.4, 85 1.4, 135 1.4, with more coming currently available for pre-order only. These are all sub-$2,000 lenses with sterling reputations. You can also now buy four purpose-built, also more modestly priced, native L-mount lenses from Panasonic, from the superb Pro-Level S-Pro 51.4, S-Pro 24-72.8, and 70-200 F4 zooms, to the image-stabilized non-Pro, it's okay, 24-105 F4 between $13 and $2,300. Though, as of this morning, Panasonic has also announced their $1,500 S-Pro 16 to 35 IV and $2,600 70 to 200 2.8. You can also use adapters with everything from Canon and Nikon to PL and M lenses. In other words, one year later, the SL lens ecosystem has grown from one shipping native L-mount lens to 19 with a pile more coming. It's fascinating that this dwarfs what is available in native full-frame mirrorless mount from Canon or Nikon. For now, anyway. What a difference a couple of years and one alliance can make. Now, nits. Well, with all of this said, and back to the SL2 itself, I do have some nits. 
I wish that it had phase detect autofocus so that we could once and for all put questions about autofocus to bed. Though thus far, I am perfectly happy with what it does. I wish the SL2 had an articulating rear screen, though I don't know how they could pull that off without compromising the of a solid block of aluminum feel. What else? I wish the on-off switch were a collar around the shutter release. I didn't see pixel shifting anywhere on the menus. I didn't see panoramic stitching either, but neither of these burn with me. I... I wish Leica had a robust tethering solution for stills and video. I wish there were triggers for ProPhoto and other high-end flash systems. I wish the Photos app were more robust, functionally richer for capture and edit, faster and more consistent at connecting. I was going to say I wish the ISO button weren't so awkward to get to on the top of the plate, but then I just remapped it to the button right next to the EVF where my thumb naturally falls. I wish it were smaller, lighter, and cheaper, but that's piggy, and we already have the CL, which is a baby SL2 anyway. That's why we got the CL in the first place. Yes, final wish. I wish the SL2 had as powerful a processor and as rich a set of algorithms as my iPhone Pro 11, so that 14 or 15 stops of dynamic range could become 20 computationally, about the capability of the human eye. Other than that, I'm good. Still, as I mentioned earlier, open items remain. I need to spend more time with the autofocus using different lenses. I think there's a story there. And I need to spend more time at higher ISOs. I need more time to explore battery life. I need to spend more time perusing the raw files so that I can distinguish between what is JPEG processing and what is the sensor itself. I need to see how the preamps work, though it's unlikely I'd ever use this camera's audio for anything other than syncing purposes. If you guys have any questions or I've missed something, please let me know in the comments section down below and I'll try to answer them. So, what does all of this mean to you? Well, first, if you already have a current generation full-frame mirrorless camera and it's working for you, I'll just say it. Don't worry, be happy, go out and enjoy it, especially if it's already sporting 40 plus megapixels. Try to pay off a credit card or three. Spend an afternoon or 10 with someone you love, a smartphone at home, no camera in sight, and just be in the moment. If you already have a current generation crop sensor mirrorless interchangeable lens camera like the Panasonic G9 or Fujifilm's X-T3, and you don't have a clear and compelling need to go bigger, don't. Forget about it. Just go out and enjoy that. If you have a GH5 and are heavy into video, stick with it. All of these cameras and their siblings are superb and dramatically smaller, lighter, and less expensive taken in toto than any of their full-frame counterparts, let alone the SL2. You can do as much or more with a GH5 shooting video at base ISO and real DP's light than you can with a full-frame mirrorless and with crop sensors Long glass is also sufficiently smaller, lighter, and less expensive that you can offset most of the SL2's 10 10th sensor resolution and lens image quality by shooting longer, like this. a given field of view, the only full-frame or smaller camera that could possibly beat the SL2 ecosystem at ginormous magnification is Sony's 61 megapixel A7R4, and they've got some great glass for that system too. Then again, if you've stayed with me this long, you probably already understand that it is a radically different shooting experience. Different folks will have different takes on that, but frankly, 61, 47.3, 45.7, or 42 whatever megapixels simply do not matter if you're not printing or projecting big and looking closely full stop. Still, with that proviso, 
If you don't fall into any of the above categories, want to go to full frame mirrorless hybrid, want the best autofocus in the business, want excellent glass by and large, and don't mind something less than best in class IBIS, Ergos, touch implementation or menu system, yeah, Sony really ought to be your first port of call, especially for pro sports and wildlife shooters. If you're a Nikon or Canon shooter looking to go mirrorless, one option, of course, is to stay within the fold by purchasing a Z, R, or RP body, respectively. I can see it more for Nikon users than Canon users because only the Nikon has a high megapixel offering in the Z7, and only the Nikon Z7 or Z6 in this two-brand matchup have IBIS. Current Canon sensors are also simply not competitive with other full-frame mirrorless options for video. A mirrorless camera can be revelatory for its EVF alone. You may want to protect your investment in glass. You may want a flippy screen. You may not want to give up Canon's outstanding dual pixel AF, though there are caveats to that when shooting video. On the other hand, if you want to go full frame interchangeable lens mirrorless, but still want the feel of a DSLR and or you want dual card slots, I think your first port of call should actually be Panasonic's S1 or S1R. As I'm sure I've mentioned somewhere, or I will, I'd call these two the most completely thought out and functionally rich of all of them. They really only fall short on autofocus and then, again, only for sports and wildlife. I'm talking fast wildlife, fast sports, not voles and not lawn bowling. I'd say the Z7, however, is the best value in high-resolution full-frame mirrorless hybrid cameras. The Z6, the best value of all if high-resolution isn't required. Both have better ergos, build quality, IBIS, and video specs than Sony, which is, by the way, all the way up to 12-bit ProRes RAW out through HDMI, if that's important to you, and are smaller, lighter, and less expensive than the Panasonic's, once again, let alone the SL2. Neither Canon nor Nikon has the breadth and depth of native mount glass, I'm talking as I was before, Z and RF, that now exist for Sony or the L-Mount Alliance. If budget is less of a concern, well, nothing can touch the SL2 for build quality, character, or heritage. I think nothing actually touches the glass either. On the other hand, again, if you're a sports or a wildlife shooter and have already invested in some of those legendary Canon and Nikon long telephotos, just stick with the DSLR you've already got or take a long, hard look at Sony's A9 II. Of course, if you really want to move up to high-resolution, full-frame, mirrorless, interchangeable lens ecosystem, aren't wedded to what you have now, and like the SL2, well, the closest competitor is the S1R. As I said earlier, it's not unfair to assume it shares a lot of its DNA with the SL2. For 40% less, you really ought to take a close look at it yourself. I think it is a formidable camera, though I prefer the ergos and feel and heritage and how I feel holding the SL2. Still, I'd be happy to have one. Then again, I'd be happy to have the Z7. Let's get real. I'm delighted to have my CL. I love my iPhone Pro 11. The GH5 has been our bread and butter for documentary and commercial work for almost three years. As Sheryl Crow says, in the end, it's not having what you want, it's wanting what you've got. Finally, if you've been thinking about going medium format or like M, or simply want to get off the annual trade-up merry-go-round, just want to shoot, and have the wherewithal to do so, I think you need to look very, very hard at the SL2. After almost... 5,000 words now. Do I really need to say more other than autofocus is, especially at my age, really, really nice to have. And whenever you'd like, you can still use M glass with it at higher resolution than any M yet made in the best EVF in the business. In the end, the SL2 and SL lens ecosystem are about the experience of shooting, the end result of shooting, the power of imagery, and how the pursuit of these things changes and enriches one's life. Anyway, it's late. I'm exhausted. You must be too. So let's wrap this up for now by answering the one question I've raised but not yet answered. What's up with Vader? Well, Darth Vader, duh. It was the internal project name for the SL2, which has to make you wonder, what were they thinking? I don't know for sure, because I didn't ask. Frankly, 
I didn't think it necessary. It was clear from our time in Germany. It's clear in the metal right here and now. And I'll be sharing more with you in the coming days that everyone associated with bringing the SL2 to market was pretty darn excited, pumped, true believers, as in the force is strong in this one. They're right. You forgot to mention the SL2 is very angular and very, very black. Did you mention it was powerful? I did. Okay, just checking. Thank you.